book, and we'll move on to our final speaker of the uh, of this mini seminar series, um, Howard Griffiths, who is a professor of plant ecology at uh, Cambridge University, and is going to continue the theme of C4 and also CAM photosynthesis. Okay, thanks. Can you see my screen? Yeah, brilliant. Perfect. Okay, you're about. I'm going to about to go try to go full. There we go. Fantastic. Um, Thank you very much to both to the organisers for uh, inviting me to participate in this uh, commemoration of the JX bot and also to the previous speakers who've um, set the scene rather brilliantly, which means that I don't have to give too much of, of a specific introduction, but I can sort of get on relatively quickly into the into the topic. And as you'll see from the title, um, I'm going to start out with by giving a little bit of a historical background, but I'm then going to move into what I suppose uh, having given that historical and perhaps personal background, um, and to move into an area where, where, where my expertise, uh, I'm beginning to reach the limits of my expertise, and I, I'm trying to get out of my comfort zone. So uh, bear with me if I try to uh, introduce some of the latest thinking we're having about applying molecular technologies to the breadth of uh, the, the carbon concentrating mechanisms. Uh, no, let's... Okay. So uh, I'd like to take us back to uh, what I think is a, an absolute landmark paper, which really shaped my uh, thinking um, about all the successive teaching and uh, public lectures I've been giving for many years, which was the, the, the chapter by Osman, Winter and Ziegler in the, uh, uh, the Plant um, Physiology Encyclopedia. Uh, and also the influence, of course, of, of, of John Raven. And um, what I'd like to do now is to try to introduce what we may think of as the, an additional context in that original uh, volume. So in that book and uh, in that chapter, uh, Barry, Klaus and Hubert, they gave us these uh, stylized diagrams of the, of the processes which we've been hearing so much about um, earlier uh, today or this evening, wherever you happen to be. Uh, and uh, I guess I don't really need to go into the detail of this, but just to explain that really this comparative approach to the physiology of these various pathways is really what kind of um, attracted me to, uh, and, and hopefully has kept me in science for this length of time. Um, so, uh, and in, in some ways uh, using the stable isotopes, which they drew attention to in that chapter, um, we were, I was able with other colleagues to develop a various comparative approaches to various um, uh, functional groups and their associated carbon concentrating mechanisms, be it in the bromeliads, be it uh, or where we only have CAM or C3, but also of course equivalently for um, uh, C4, be it in lichens where we have both alveol and cyanobacterial photobionts and then ultimately into hornworts and bryophytes. And so that sort of framework informed by trying to understand what exactly uh, allows plants to be able to adapt with their mechanisms to the natural environment has traditionally informed my approaches. And I guess um, bringing us now into the, the realm of looking at the, uh, the, 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 the three categories of concentrating mechanisms that we're going to, I'm going to run through um, with a sort of a sequence of this, both this historical background and then the perhaps a, a hopefully some new insights for uh, understanding the transcriptional regulation of these processes. And so uh, firstly, uh, just uh, the work Vanna and uh, Chandra have done in, in the, since uh, in the last decade or so, uh, moved us into thinking about the energetic efficiencies of the C4 pathway. Um, my, uh, I think I always try to challenge the C4 community, not just to think about the carbon concentrating mechanism, but also to think about the, the additional uh, processes, the hydraulics, the potential uh, origins of that bundle sheath and, and what the advantages might have been. We've seen some other really neat suggestions about the role of um, nitrogen cycling and capture and so on. Uh, and I, I've just draw attention uh, in, partly to keep it in the family uh, to one of Brent's recent papers where he actually shows that the hydraulic properties of C4 plants 
in the more in the older C4 lineages have now started to relax um, under the improved water um, water constraints that they have as a result of the C4 pathway. So that really follows on quite nicely from these early thoughts about the um, selective drivers for the origins of the bundle sheath. So now let's move up to very much to today's data and I'm really grateful here for the uh, the collaboration uh, with Julian Hibbard down the corridor from me but also specifically for the purposes of this talk this morning is the contribution from Pallavi Singh uh, and her recent work um, looking at the and, and looking at the transcriptomic uh, responses in uh, development in C4 plants. And so just to sort of set the scene and remind ourselves that we've traditionally had the transcriptomic approach, which has burgeoned over the last 10, 15 years or so. And now we're adding to this the more specific DNA uh, sequencing or ATAC sequencing, which is allowing us to identify specific regions of the uh, and, and uh, transcription factor regions, interacting regions, which relate specifically to the specificity of the various processes engaged in the in the C4 pathway. Um, and to sort of set the scene, uh, Stephen Burgess with Julian and, and Pallavi uh, and, and colleagues uh, showed very nicely how in an evolutionary terms we can see that there are these specific digital genomic footprints which have uh, which relate back to the early origins of the Poaceae uh, within the bundle sheath cells of those early grasses, which have then been co-opted and adapted and developed as we see the development of the of the C4 lineages um, coming through to the the modern day maize and uh, and sorghum, and so that gives us a, a clue perhaps to the way that these processes relate both uh, phylogenetically and developmentally to the, uh, the, the, the development of the bundle sheath initially. And again, informing the sort of work that we've just been hearing about from Bob very elegantly about the need to understand the co-regulation of, of expression into those two contrasting cell types, the mesophyll cell types and the, and the, and the bundle sheath. So, um, Pallavi has uh, been undertaking a, 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 a kind of a de-etylation de study on uh, Gynandropsis gynandra, which used to be known as Cleome in old days, in old money, uh, and looking at this uh, transfer of these uh, 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 developing seedlings from dark into light over a 24 hour cycle and examining the transcriptomic progression that we see during that developmental progression. Um, and from that, developing a, uh, a heat map illustrating the, the, the transcript abundance of the various genes that are being expressed during that 24-hour uh, time cycle um, and identifying those which are either high, showing high levels of uh, expression, intermediate levels of expression, or uh, rather much more limited expression, um, and then identifying the specific um, uh, genes and and their and their orthologs from uh, from compared with Arabidopsis. So uh, this is a this can then be applied to identify the transcription factors which are coupling these various processes, um, whereby we both have the development of the in in the in the cotyledon, cotyledons there of the the photosynthetic processes, but also looking for specific. C4 genes and the timing of their induction and expression. And then from that, one can then get a, 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 a kind of a, a, a network, one of these gene regulatory networks showing the various uh, key regulators, the highly connected and then the highly regulated genes, which are associated with the development of both the uh, whole photosynthetic process, but also in tandem, the induction of the C4 process. And that in turn, when coupled to the DNA's seq, then allows uh, them to identify um, the specific um, transcription factor that are associated with these various gene expression uh, processes. And so we can then get these very detailed in integrated transcriptional networks. And the key take home message here seems to be that there is a commonality between the way that um, the C4 genes are being uh, upregulated and 
those which are those existing sort of traditional photosynthetic components which are responding to light and there just seems to be a coupling which indicates that um, if you like we've seen the processes whereby light induces the standard gene expression for C3 photosynthesis those transcription factors and regulatory networks have been co-opted by the C4 pathway because we see many parallels in the, uh, the transcription factor families which bring about both the induction of uh, C4 genes as well as just the general light responsiveness. So there's lessons here, and I think Mark alluded to this in his final comments before he, he, he ran off to his meeting, about the way that we need to think about additional uh, regulatory factors other than just thinking about carbon it's about what actually controls and what are the fundamental triggers for gene expression of these various processes. So moving on um, into our sort of comparative study of uh, carbon concentrating mechanisms, of course, this would naturally take me back to where I feel is my second home. Um, and again, I have to say, giving this historical perspective, it was Barry Osman that first suggested in about 1979, I think, that hearing that I was had the opportunity to go to, to Trinidad to, on an expedition, that Cam Bromeliad would be a su suitable subject for study. And been very fortunate in the past uh, uh, six, eight years or so to uh, go there repeatedly working with Jamie Males in order to map the distribution and limits to distribution of these epiphytes. And... Um, undertake uh, the sorts of crazy activities that I suppose have uh, characterized most of my career and interactions with the with the great locals and uh, and this is a slide just to show the extent that we can we can get to this is a slide I've just prepared for um, at the talk that I had to give at, at our local Fitzwilliam Museum uh, and where I'm now going to have to prepare a chapter all on the origins and uh, economic and, uh, and biological origins of the pineapple um, but uh, we'll move on from that. So bringing the CAM story up to date, moving back from the field into the laboratory, um, we've, well, I'm now fortunate to following up the work of Barney and Nick that we've now got Matawi, uh, who firstly is, has taken Nick's model uh, in, and turned it into a slightly more um, accessible um, calculus, calculated form using, uh, uh, using uh, uh, differential equations but using MATLAB so we hope that this will be more readily available than the original uh, Vensim system that Nick prepared and just a couple of snapshot slides here which uh, taking some of the data that uh, Susanna uh, allowed me kindly to generate uh, in Canberra in 2007 I think um, are, are having a few working the late shift uh, with some Kalinkoe uh, species uh, trying to perturb their stomatal responsiveness by altering the CO2 concentrations through the light-dark cycle. Matawi has now been uh, applying the developed model that she's uh, she's created from Nick's original model and shows pretty good uh, relationship between the, 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 the model in the continuous line and the actual gas exchange data that we, we published in that paper. So that's again sort of moving forward in terms of the, the, uh, phys the, the, the physiology, modeling the physiology but we also were uh, uh, really uh, had a good opportunity to try to put our thoughts together about a year ago when we were when this uh, special issue of the plant journal and that in that we came up with a number of key areas where we felt that we that would lend itself to more advanced molecular analysis uh, again thinking from this uh, trying to expand into the to understand the drivers for the origins and evolution of the CAM pathway but looking at it from a gene regulatory process and we identified a number of uh, large-scale experimental data we could use we identified physiological questions that we could address if we had a better understanding of the molecular basis to uh, the origins of CAM um, in terms of stomatal physiology, musical metabolism, whole plant hydraulics and then we could then in turn, hopefully fit that back into that large scale modeling system to make the sort of predictions that uh, uh, were captured really in, in Barry Osman's original uh, sentient uh, 1978 review. So that's where we've been, um, we've been, uh, we've been moving. And what, uh, what Matawi has now been able to do is to take some of the studies on gene expression, um, 
which uh, were recently published by Yang et al. Um, and comparing the overall Kalenkoe genome. And in this particular study, they, they also compared elements of the Kalenkoe genome with that of pineapple and, um, and Arabidopsis to look at the co-expression patterns and so on. Having sampled the transcriptome across 12 points with across the day-night cycle, and then uh, specifically looked in the in, in some of the in some of the data that they presented, looked at the gene expression for Pepsi kinase and phototropin, and compared the overall uh, day-night expression um, between uh, Arabidopsis and the and the two cam plants. So that was the the data set, and uh, Xiaohan uh, Yang very kindly provided us with the core data set, and from that, Matawi has now been developing a gene regulatory network based on that transcriptome study uh, uh, in collaboration, I have to say, with Gita Gitanjali Yadav, uh, who's been uh, advising us on the on the various methods and, and so on. So from this study, um, she's now identified the sort of this CAM uh, sort of a functional sub network with 72 no nodes and edges. Clearly, these are terms with which I'm very familiar. Um, uh, and um, uh, uh, so um, <clears throat> bear with me while I try to pick my way through the um, the tutoring that these worthy souls have been giving me over the past uh, week or so. This is very much data which is in process, in progress for, for all of the elements I'm going to talk about um, here today. But what we can see is that there are distinct uh, nodes of gene expression which uh, relate to carboxylation, the key components, some circadian control, stomatal movement, and particularly we've been able to identify particular groups of uh, plant transcription factors which um, seem to be actively involved in the regulation of core um, uh, crassulation acid metabolism genes. And if we look in a little bit more detail, specifically focusing on that PEP carboxylase kinase gene, what uh, Mitawi has identified are two specific transcripts which are potential regulators of the PEP CK, uh, PEP kinase, PEP Pepsi kinase gene. Um, and we think this is, this I think shows the power of this approach because we've now identified targets which could be used in the, in the sort of trans, uh, transformational approach that um, uh, James Hartwell and colleagues has been using to now target the potential uh, next stage of regulation that we see in this well-known regulator of Pepsi activity. So we think this is a really quite exciting advances that have come out of this transcriptomic study. We've also come up with other genes showing that other um, core elements of the of the CAM C4 metabolism are under specific and targeted uh, regulatory control. Um, as I say, so this is currently a work in progress. Um, and of course, uh, logically, what we will now need to do is to uh, attempt to put our, our, our our, I suppose our actual experimental money where our, math, our modeling uh, mouth has been and uh, the next stage will be for um, Matawi to uh, try ATAC sequencing on this Kalinkoe species to try to actually identify the transcriptional binding sites and to, to link whether the actual transcriptional binding sites relate to these uh, targets that we've just identified. Okay, so moving on now from uh, having done C4, from having done CAM, we can now move in to think about um, the, think a little bit about the carbon concentrating mechanism in, in uh, aquatic plants. Again, all featured in Barry's, uh, Barry's uh, original chapter um, in the Encyclopedia in of Plant Physiology. And again, some of the work that I, we did with John Raven and John Beardall was partly prompted by Barry's visit to Dundee at the same time that he suggested I, I go off to Trinidad. So, um, and, and at that time, we started out working on firstly on chlorella. We heard from Mark earlier this morning uh, the relevance of chlorella uh, and the uh, the carbon concentrating net mechanism there. Of course, lichen photobionts consist either of a green alga, some which of which have a, a carbon concentrating mechanism, some don't, or cyanobacteria. And then uh, we also looked at the hornworts and the carbon concentrating mechanism there. And most recently, our focus has been primarily on chlamydomonas and the biophysical CCM that operates there. And again, I think I owe a tremendous debt here to uh, Moritz Mayer. Um, in 
for the work that he did in when we when we first started out trying to characterize in more detail the clamidomonas concentrating mechanism and again a conversation arising from a Gordon conference with Bob Spreitzer uh, asking whether it would be possible to do some uh, transformation of Rubisco uh, to explore some ideas we'd had about the engagement or the process which led to Rubisco aggregation within the chloroplast pyranoid. I think we heard quite a bit, little bit about that from Mark this morning. Uh, it, the, this is the starch, uh, starch uh, micro compartment uh, surrounded by starch within which there's a Rubisco matrix which is supplied by an amazing network of tubules uh, coalesced thylakoid membranes which also have within them mini tubules which in turn deliver a direct connectivity between the stroma and the uh, and the and the and the, th the paranoid matrix so for those of you who were here earlier and heard the conversations about the movement of RUBP uh, and the gradient of RUBP that is needed to, to get from uh, into the into the paranoid or possibly the um, and the movement back of PGA those are the processes by which this exchange can occur from within the pyranoid. Now what Moritz and uh, Todor Genkov did in Bob, Bob's lab was some remarkable engineering on the small subunit of Rubisco which uh, led us to think about the way that Rubisco aggregation could be being driven and subsequent to that uh, program with Martin Yonikas and Luke Mackinder um, then discovered the uh, a, 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 a linker protein which was renamed EPIC which seems to and then the rec most recent paper from Mart uh, from Moritz together with Martin and, and, and Luke and colleagues uh, shows even in more detail a specific motif which couples together the various mem many members of that paranoid matrix. So exciting developments happening there. What we'd like to do in the meantime is to, with the group that uh, are, have been uh, working with us in Cambridge, uh, and you can see them see them pictured here, is to explore more details of this carbon concentrating mechanism. And uh, just to just to, to to run through this, uh, well, uh, rather than reading about the uh, the specifics of the carbon concentrating mechanism, which I'm sure you're quite able to do yourself, um, I'll just to quick, briefly introduce um, Indu and uh, Situ, uh, Gita, uh, uh, Miriam, Gude, Yi Zhang, uh, Rachel Wong, and, and and Tanya Matur. Now they've all been working with me for the last. Uh, two or three years or so and the work we're going to now see will represent their efforts in trying to move our understanding of the physiology of the carbon concentrating mechanism and set it in this uh, regulatory context uh, both at, firstly in a phylogenetic terms and then secondly in more um, uh, gene regulatory network terms. Um, so the, uh, the, the, this is the, 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 the work that's already been published by Miriam, where we've, as I mentioned to Mark earlier, we've looked at the distribution of the CCM right across the green algal phylogeny and looked, uh, there was no role for those specific alpha helices, but nonetheless, there has been a, rem uh, a large number of gains and some losses of the CCM across that, that uh, phylogeny. Um, and one of the things that particularly jumped out, I think, again starting very much from a rubisco centric frame of mind is that the the, the work that Miriam did with Doug and Elizabeth at, at, at Lancaster where we looked at the affinity for the purified rubisco enzymes from contrasting members of the Carafaci and that showed that there seems to be a relationship between the um, affinity of rubisco for um, CO2 and the occurrence of a, a CCM. So that and and this uh, supported my, uh, my my favoured couch potato hypothesis, showing the dynamics of Rubisco evolution over in relatively recent times, maybe in the last four or five million years, as these concentrating mechanisms have evolved, we can see um, the, the the change in um, uh, Rubisco kinetic properties adapting to that to being suffused in carbon dioxide. However, we've been focusing much more on um, the, uh, the, the clammy CCM, looking at synchronized cells, which uh, in contrast to most of the work that's done looking at cells which are transferred from high light to low, high CO2 to low CO2 to induce the CCM, here we've been using a day-night cycle, which means that the cells divide just as they go into dusk. 
Uh, and that then gives us a, a, a developmental cycle, which also maps handily onto the, um, the, the, the transcriptome that's been developed by Sabir Merchant. And so by using the framework from the transcriptomic data that's come out of several studies from uh, Sabir Merchant, we've characterized this cycle into five distinct phases, which represent the, the core stages, we think, uh, with cell division, which occurs normally just around or just after dusk, a resting phase during the dark period, and then um, a pre-dawn moment where, as Maddie Mitchell showed, the CCM actually can be induced and starts to become activated. Um, and then with the main period of CCM activity into the light and then a pre-dusk period where we've identified that there are ex changes in the extent of phosphorylation of that Rubisco linker protein, um, which seem to indicate a preparation for the um, division of the cells and the reforming of new paranoids in the divided uh, daughter cells. And so the work that uh, Situ Situ and uh, Gitanjali Yadaf have been undertaking um, has been to identify uh, transcriptomic networks and uh, across these five cycles of the stages, uh, including both positive networks of interactions between various genes. Uh, and these are specific genes that we've selected because they represented core proteins. Uh, they encoded core proteins associated with the paranoid formation and paranoid structure from the studies um, that have come out of, uh, of, of Luke's lab and, and so on. And so we've targeted on these specific CCM genes and we can find that there are both positive and negative networks which are lighting up as we see the various uh, processes occurring going through from cell division through to the induction of the CCM, the full expression of the CCM in the light and then the move towards dusk. And so um, we've got these uh, key clusters and um, uh, we, we're then able to use them to identify key genes or hubs, as we see here. And this is the latest data that has just, just come hot from, uh, from New Delhi. Um, and here we can see that we, we, we can start to identify the, where, where the, the core G, five, these are the, uh, the core genes associated with the CCM and the pyrenoid. They're in blue, how they, during the various phases of the CCM cycle, are distributed within co-express partners and the, and, the, and the particular hubs that we find. And what we can find from this is that we get particular types of CCM regulators, um, which are acting as hubs. And these hubs include the specific regulators of starch and light signaling and transcription factors. So um, we are able then to then couple this into this regulatory network, showing how these various genes and transcription factors overlap. And uh, from that, um, identify specific uh, families of transcription factors, which are in part common with the C4 pathway uh, and various classes of that are associated specifically with the active induction of the CCM or other stages of the CCM. And so we're trying to now apply this into understanding the way that the, maybe the CCM was initially uh, in, 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 inducted. So this really brings us back to the evolutionary origins and the selective pressures which led to the, CC, the algal CCM, and also, as I say, more generally to those other carbon concentrating mechanisms that we want to compare in this uh, symposium. So partly we've been putting our thoughts together uh, in, prep, in, in a Darwin review, which is honestly, uh, if the, for the JX Watt folk who are listening, it is nearly finished and nearly ready for submission. But in it, we've been trying to take a slightly more, uh, a deeper look at what may be regulating the CCM and the induction of the CCM and the signaling that's involved from chloroplast to nucleus, the transcription factor uh, processing that's required in the nucleus, the um, the, uh, the, the, the and, and also the um, uh, uh, import and assembly of those proteins back into the chloroplast and the various crosstalk that may be needed in order to coordinate pyrenoid uh, synthesis across this day-night cycle. And uh, finally, we, we've started to have some ideas about the origins and drivers for the origins of the CCM. And this is captured in these final few slides. Um, which take us again right, right back in, in, into paleo history and think a little bit about when photorespiration uh, was, would have been first evolved in those early uh, oxygen and 
oxygenic organisms, maybe two billion years ago, um, and the need to for the CCM, and this was uh, discussed with uh, myself and Roz Rickaby and Moritz Mayer in, a, in an, a, an introduction to the special issue of JXBOT in 2017, where we hypothesized that the origins of the, the biophysical CCM could have arisen maybe four to 500 million years ago at a time when there was a, a, a change in the relative ra ratio of oxygen and CO2 in seawater, which might have been a driver for the induction of the, of the uh, aquatic CCM. So, if we, when we've been making these compar comparative studies, frequently we find that genes that are associated with the CCM to be are triggered not just by low CO2. They're actually often triggered by light or indeed some form of other 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 potential stress. And the parallels we've been increasingly thinking about are that the induction and the origins of the CCM relate potentially to the stress associated with photorespiration. Uh, again, we know that the CCMs all help to suppress photorespiration, but what was the original driver that led to those processes? Was it just low CO2 or was it some other form of, of regulation? And brings us back to think about the master regulator for the CCM. Here we've had a transcription factor that was identified nearly 20 years ago and yet still has not been characterized as really controlling many elements of the CCM, some core components. So the question we've now looked at, um, or, or Indu has looked at in, in rather, rather clever detail, is to look at the gene expression profile for the CCM genes and align them with those associated with photorespiration in Chlamydomonas. And this is data taken from Fang et al. And what we see is a very close parallel between photorespiratory uh, gene expression and our core CCM genes. And what we're wondering is that rather than being a specific response to low CO2, remember all the studies that have been done for many, many years are on unsynchronized cells transferred from high C to low CO2 to understand CCM induction. Perhaps we need to take a step back from that and think about the uh, interaction between high light and photorespiratory stress. And maybe it was those um, uh, molecular triggering pathways which have been adopted to bring about the induction and expression of the CCM. So uh, just to, to wrap up, um, we, the, the, we, we think there are ex exciting future developments. We, we're uh, being associated with Pallavi and Julian's team and the progress in identifying the, the cell specific factors in specificity between mesophyll and bundle sheath cells. Um, the opportunity that we've got now to explore the distinct regulation of various CAM genes um, being followed up by uh, nuclei and ATAC sequencing. We've also done um, sequencing of five um, closely related uh, genes, uh, families, uh, species to Chlamydomonas in order to, with or without various components of the carbon concentrating mechanism. So one of the questions again that came up for Mark earlier, and we're currently assembling those genomes and hope uh, together with Yi and Miriam and C2 and Gita, as you can see here, uh, exciting developments there in comparative physiology of these uh, species with or without a carbon concentrating mechanism, with or without a pyranoid. And then finally, we're looking at the parallels between C4 and the, the various CCMs. We've got this idea that light responsiveness and photorespiratory oxidative stress potentially as the primary transcriptional trigger for both C4 and our biophysical CCM in, um, in, in, in aquatic plants. Um, and maybe a driver for that CCM induction is light stress uh, and, and specifically highlight under limiting CO2 concentrations. And that's maybe where we should be focusing or we're finding increasingly those regulatory factors lie. Um, and so again, C4 gene expression from Pallavi's data um, associated with these uh, transcriptional networks the biophysical CCM um, also seems to have co-opted a light responsive photorespiratory signaling cascade. Perhaps now we can now characterize in better detail the role of that master regulator. And uh, finally, perhaps in CAM, we have a, a slight exception. In that there don't seem to be so many such a detailed network. There seems to be more specific transcriptional factor interactions and so more to be found out there. So just to finish, I'd like to again thank the organizers 
And I kind of feel that I'm able now to, to, to hand the baton on to this new generation of carbon concentrating mechanism researchers um, that we've heard so much about from this morning's um, uh, symposium overall. Um, it's great to see the interest in all aspects of photosynthetic carbon metabolism being moved forward at such pace and with um, considerable financial support with a recognition of the challenges that face us for the, uh, for the future. So with that, I'll finish and, and thank you. So thank you very much for a, a very wide ranging and fascinating talk, Howard. Um, so I'd like to invite questions from the floor. And while we're waiting for those questions, perhaps I could ask for one. So, so you're suggesting that the CCM is perhaps a response to highlight stress. So do you have any idea which particular light stress signals may be being, trans being, being read by those transcription factors, which is resulting in downstream gene expression? Not at the moment. I mean, I it's a, it's a, it's a, it was documented by um, Arthur Grossman and colleagues in 2002 that, 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 that highlight could induce the CCM and increase the activity of it. And I think we've rather sort of um, sort of moved away thinking just about this CO2 inductive stimulus to, to forget about this. But as yet, we don't know. And I think this is something that hopefully we will find in more detail as we get more, more, more of these studies completed. Okay, thank you, Howard. I think Oliver has a raised hand. Uh, as oh, sorry, no, I haven't seen that. Please, please go ahead, <laughs> Oliver. <laughs> Oliver, do you have a question? I take it that's Oliver from um, from um, Singapore. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Can you hear me? Okay. Excellent. Uh, great talk. Um, I uh, I'm sort of. Uh, Intrigued by the epic one phosphorylation uh, uh, that you just sort of mentioned, um, because in the literature uh, there was this indication that epic one might be phosphorylated at low CO2 levels, and of course um, it tends to be the case that uh, phosphorylation will generally um, inhibit phase separation, maybe you know in other systems. So I was just wondering whether you're uh, uh, comment or uh, you know whether you had any any comment to that yeah sure I, I had to rather disappoint Indu because I didn't feel I could include her her very nice slide showing the differential status of phosphorylation across the 24-hour cycle basically what we seem to show and why we've got this pre-dusk specialized section it seems to become more phosphorylated at dusk as we're approaching cell division and we wonder whether this is okay. part of the disassembly process um, yeah, because that, that's 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 in other systems. That's what you would think. You um, uh, the phosphorylation will uh, basically um, counteract the the condensation, so to speak. Yep. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Um, Got a question from Bob. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, I th I think I think the the, the the, we've been discussing a lot about where this oxidative, uh, whether it, whether we can find evidence for a straight oxidative stress signal. There's certainly interest in some of the some of the evidence that Rachel's been putting together. There's a um, there's some of the signaling that seems to be uh, the, the, the calcium signaling that seems to trigger gene expression. Um, one might be associated with with straight oxidative stress, um, as, which you know. And I'm always fascinated by. Um, I think it's. Uh, by Christine Foyer's observations. I remember in a symposium, maybe uh, an SEB symposium, where she explained how photorespiration generates equimolar concentrations of hydrogen peroxide relative to CO2 fixation per unit leaf area. And I, um, so it's, it, it clearly produces, photorespiration clearly is a huge stress on a, on a given cell. Uh, and the extent that that may be part of a, a, a stress related signal. And so a, why, why not ABA as well? Um, quite possibly. 
Uh, do you have enough data yet to, to know about conservation of these networks? I mean, is there much diversity amongst spe between species or are they highly conserved? Well, I mean, that, in a way, that's why we're, uh, as I say, it's a, a work in progress. We, we're, we, we just came to the conclusions about the, the tight parallels in, in similar transcription factor networks that we, we just sort of identified this in the last couple of weeks. Um, and uh, so I can't be more specific at the moment. What we would hope to do is to try and draw this together if we're able to put this into a, into a chapter or, or a, um, uh, you know, a, a review. So yeah, I think this is the really exciting point is to identify the, the commonalities in the various transcription factor um, families that may be involved in elements of this upregulation of the, of the distinct carbon concentrating mechanisms. But then of course, the other thing is hopefully from the analysis of the chloromonas and chlamydomonas comparison um, and, the, and the, the, trans, the, um, the gene sequencing we're doing there, we may get a better idea of that um, comparison between closely related species which, which have or don't express a CCM. Thank you. So uh, we've now got a question from Nick. Coming, coming back to the um, rather interesting question of um, an oxidative kind of signal um, controlling the CCM expression, <laughs> One of the things that's always I've been a bit curious about is, well, of course, one potential source is, is photorespiration and glycolate oxidase. But my understanding is that chlamydomonas and maybe quite a lot of other algae don't have glycolate oxidase. They have a dehydrogenase that doesn't generate hydrogen peroxide. Is that correct, Howard? And yes, I think, yes, I think you're right there, Nick. Yeah, yeah. I mean, historically, there was... Uh, I seem to recall, and again, <laughs> haven't quite dug back in time to, to, to the, there, there, were, there were a lot more data about uh, algae and aquatic plants generally excreting glycolate um, in order to uh, overcome, you know, any photorespiratory products. Can you remember that? I, I, I can, because I was thinking about it a while ago and I was trying to find some literature, but there was, there was some literature on um, marine algae, um, excreting glycolate yeah. but I, I and I do I... remember Rowan Sage um, making that comment I think in a in a in the in a plenary at the uh, photosynthesis congress maybe in Brisbane about the about the the switch to um to, to glycolate oxidase um I think he was relating that more to land plants and, and move, movement onto land sure so I, I, I was wondering, therefore, if you're talking about an oxidative signal, where that would come from, because if clammy doesn't have glycolate oxidase, it's presumably therefore a, a photosynthesis. Yeah, well, that, so that's why we're both thinking about just the, the overall sort of light, light stress as a, an equivalent signal, perhaps, to some form of oxidative stress. Because sure. I think you know that, that, that the the if you like the the sort of photo inhibitory responses that one might get, even um, even though aquatic plants tend to be adapted to really low uh, photon fluences, um, uh, limiting CO two could cause light stress even at those relatively low fluences. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the question, Nick. Are there any more questions before I? Uh... Thank our final speaker and, and hand back to John to, to round up. Okay, I'll uh, I'll take that as a no. Thank you very much, Howard, for a fascinating talk, and uh, I'll I'll hand back to John.